Queen Guinevere and the women of Arthurian legend. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. The legend of King Arthur and Camelot is the most enduring myth of the British Isles. His wife and queen, Guinevere, and the many other women in the story, including Enchantress Morgan Le Fay and Nimue, the mystical lady of the lake, have been cast as heroines, virtuous women, and wicked femme fatales by the many people who have retold and reshaped the legend over one and a half millennia. Because of the oral tradition and many retellings of the tale, it is impossible to write a definitive summary of the events therein. But today, let's sketch the highlights of the story, galloping past the oft-retold battles and quests of the Knights of the Round Table, and focusing on the many parts women had to play. Then we'll take a look at the way the legend morphed through the passage of time, and some of the reverberations Queen Guinevere, King Arthur, and the women of Camelot and Avalon have had on real history. Let's travel back to misty and mythical southwestern England and Wales in the 6th century. The Romans had abandoned the island as untamable less than a century earlier, and the lands were ruled by dozens of rival kings. Saxons from the continent were threatening to wrest control from the native Britons. Christianity had just been introduced, and the new religion was at war with the Druids and the ancient pagan faith for the minds and souls of the people. Our story begins with Ygraine, the wife of Gorlois, Duke of Cornwall. Ygraine had three daughters, the youngest of which, Morgan, had been sent to the magician Merlin to be educated in the ways of magic. She earned the name Morgan Le Fay, or the Fairy, for her great knowledge of shape-shifting, illusion, and spells. The greatest king of the area, Uther Pendragon, had no sons to inherit his crown and he became consumed with passion for the Lady Grain. He invited her and her husband to his court, but they didn't trust the king and refused his invitation. Desperate in his obsession, Uther begged Merlin to help, and he agreed under the condition that the first son born of Uther's union with the Grain must be given to him to be brought up. Uther agreed, and Merlin worked his spell. The king waged war on Gorlois, who was killed in battle. Meanwhile, Uther disguised himself by magic to look like Gorlois, rode to his wife, and slept with her. Once Ygraine discovered the deception and that she was pregnant, she had little choice but to marry King Uther. When her son Arthur was born, her new husband insisted that she hand the baby over to Merlin, much to her sorrow. Ygraine gave birth to another child, a daughter, Morgos. Uther sent his wife's older daughters by her first husband to a Christian convent where Morgan Le Fay continued to practice the magical arts, though she turned against her former teacher Merlin, possibly because he had brought about the murder of her father and the rape of her mother. King Uther died and Queen Ygraine did not live to see her son grow up. Without a strong king, the country fell to chaos. So when Arthur was nearly a man, Merlin devised a plan to unite the country and make him king. All great men were called to Westminster, and there in a churchyard they found a large stone with a sword raising out of it. An inscription read, whoever draws this sword is the rightful king of England. Many men tried to rest the sword, but all failed. Finally, Arthur strode up in front of the crowd and drew the sword easily from the stone. He was proclaimed by all the King of England. One of the many lords who swore loyalty to the new king was King Leodegrance. He asked Arthur's help in fending off a rival. After their victorious battle, Leodegrance invited Arthur back to his castle to celebrate. 
Merlin warned Arthur not to attend, but the young king, always up for a good time, went anyway. After the feast, as Arthur was falling asleep, he heard the soft melody of a harp echoing through the castle. Enchanted, he rose from his bed. He found the player, a dazzling woman, sitting alone in a room. Arthur was struck by love for her. Merlin, who was creeping around, told Arthur that this was Guinevere, but that he should forget her, for marrying her would bring him only misery and ruin. Naturally, Arthur ignored the warning and went to King Leodegrance to ask for his daughter's hand in marriage. In ancient Welsh, the name Guinevere means the white enchantress or ghost. Her family was descended from the ancient Romans who conquered the island of Britain in the year 43, but abandoned it in 410. Guinevere was a raven-haired beauty with a striking appearance, and certainly someone of Mediterranean descent would have stood out among the fair Britons. Merlin decided that his reckless young ward would need serious supernatural protection. So he took him to the shores of a misty lake and told him that its waters separated life from death. Beyond the mists lay the island of apple trees, or Avalon, on which dwelled supernatural beings who were neither alive nor dead, and they had powers for both good and evil. As the moon passed over the water, a hand rose from the lake, holding a glistening sword. The hand was that of the enchantress Nimue, the Lady of the Lake. She was the current in a long line of ladies of the lake who possessed supernatural powers similar to those of Merlin. Arthur accepted the sword Excalibur from her and was told that the sword would bring strength and victory, but whoever wore the scabbard would never die of his wounds. While mystical swords distributed by watery tarts during farcical aquatic ceremonies might have offered the best protection in the Dark Ages, there is a much better option for digital defense today, NordVPN. Going online without a VPN is like living in King Arthur's time without a castle. You are vulnerable to attack from a whole horde of hackers looking to pillage your personal and financial information. But with NordVPN, one click pulls up the drawbridge on your digital life. With over 5,200 servers in 59 countries, NordVPN is the fastest out there. Using NordVPN offers peace of mind, but it also comes with some fun perks. It might not surprise you to learn that I am a big Anglophile, and NordVPN allows me to change my location and stream a ton of British shows that are not available in the US. Right now, fans of my channel can go to nordvpn.com slash lindsayholiday to get a two-year plan plus four additional months with a huge discount. And now, back to history. Back at Camelot, while awaiting his wedding day, Arthur was lonely. On a stormy night, an attractive woman arrived seeking shelter. Arthur offered her a bed, and he shared it with her. The next morning, the woman had vanished. Sometime later, on the morning of Arthur's wedding to Guinevere, the king found Merlin walking the castle ramparts and looking apprehensively at a group of approaching riders. He told Arthur that they were his three half-sisters, the daughter of his mother, Igraine, by her first husband. The first two came to make their peace, but the third, Morgan Le Fay, Merlin attested, was evil. Riding with Morgan was a small boy, and Arthur demanded to know who he was. Merlin answered that the child was Mordred. Arthur's son by his sister, Margos, who had been sent to seduce him by Morgan le Fay. The wizard warned that Mordred was the weapon Morgan would use against him and that he was destined to be Arthur's Judas. Arthur went on to marry Guinevere, his great love, and the couple were happy together, though they remained childless. 
Her father, King Leodegrance, presented Arthur with the legendary round table, making all of his knights equal and part of a mystical chain. The great deeds of the Knights of the Round Table enticed many mighty warriors to flock to Camelot and swear loyalty to Arthur. The court flourished and became famous and revered throughout the land. And Merlin disappeared. Morgan le Fay frequently appeared in the legends as a lover and a foil to various knights. She became the chief of nine magical queen sisters, including Nimue, who ruled the island of Avalon. They had powers to cure diseases, control the sea, transform into animals, and glimpse the future. Morgan despised her half-brother Arthur, and when her nephew, Mordred, grew to a man, she sent him to Camelot to serve Arthur and to undermine him. One evening, the Lady of the Lake arrived in Camelot with a young warrior. She told Arthur that his name was Lancelot and that Merlin had given him to her as a child and instructed her to raise him to be Arthur's greatest knight. For many months, Lancelot stayed at court and became the constant companion of the king and of the queen. Guinevere and Lancelot developed a deep admiration and attraction for each other. He rescued her from danger, and her charm and beauty enchanted him. But per the virtues of Christianity and chivalric love, they knew they must never consummate their relationship. Tortured by proximity to the woman he adored, Lancelot took his leave to go on a quest. He rode to the castle of King Peles, which was plagued by a terrible dragon. He slayed the beast and was honored with a magnificent feast. Pele's daughter, Princess Elaine, fell in love with the knight, but she was devastated to learn that he was devoted to Guinevere and would not think of any other woman. Elaine begged the help of a sorceress who offered her a magical ring which disguised her as Guinevere. She invited Lancelot to her bed, but the next morning he discovered the deception and was consumed by anguish. He threatened to kill Elaine, but he left her unharmed when she told him she was pregnant with his child. Lancelot returned to Camelot and Elaine followed him there, but he ignored her. She once again disguised herself as Guinevere and went to the knight's bed. That evening, the real Queen Guinevere finally gave in to her desire for Lancelot and went to his chamber. But she found him in bed with Elaine. Lancelot went mad with grief, jumped naked out of a window, and ran away. Elaine returned home and found Lancelot in her garden, still naked and raving. She led him to her father's greatest treasure, the Holy Grail, the cup from which Christ drank at the Last Supper, and which was filled with his blood at the crucifixion. She bid him drink from the chalice, and he was cured of his madness. Lancelot lived with Elaine and their son for several years, but he was eventually overwhelmed by regret and his obsession with Guinevere. He returned to Camelot and confessed all to King Arthur. Just then, a barge sailed into Camelot, bearing the corpse of Elaine, who had died of a broken heart. When Lancelot shared tales of the Holy Grail with his fellow knights of the Round Table, many set off on quests to win this most holy relic, and many were killed on their adventures. Only the knight with a pure heart could possess the grail. The one who finally won it was Elaine and Lancelot's son, Galahad, the purest and greatest of all knights. Being the grandson of King Peles, who owned the grail, probably helped too. Once Galahad saw the grail and a vision of Christ, he died so as never to sully his purity. His father Lancelot was denied the grail because he and Guinevere had finally given in to their all-consuming desires and had begun an adulterous relationship. The queen, while out for her daily rides on horseback, was meeting Lancelot in secret. 
Mordred led his father to discover Guinevere and Lancelot together. Arthur was heartbroken at the betrayal of his wife and closest friend, and Mordred, ever helpful, reminded him that the law demanded adulterers be burned at the stake. Lancelot escaped, but Arthur's knights captured Queen Guinevere. She was tied to a pyre and torches were lit, ready to burn her alive. Just then, Lancelot rode up, fought off the knights, hacked the ropes tying his beloved, and rode away with her. They were found, poorly hidden, at Lancelot's castle. Arthur's knights laid siege and many of them died in the battle. Finally, the triangle came to an agreement. Guinevere returned to Camelot with her husband, and Lancelot went into exile in France. But Arthur could not let go of his fury and pursued Lancelot, unwisely leaving Mordred in charge of Camelot. Naturally, Mordred betrayed his father and declared himself king. He tried to claim Queen Guinevere as his wife, but she refused and escaped to a convent. Arthur rode home to reclaim his kingdom. On his journey, he had a dream warning him not to fight his son right away. So he called a truce and the two armies squared up behind Arthur and Mordred as they met on the battlefield. During the hushed tension, one of Mordred's followers was bitten by an adder. When the knight drew his sword to kill the snake, Arthur's men saw the flash of the blade and attacked. The knights fought all day, and when only a few remained standing, Arthur spied his son across the field. He raced to attack him, but the magical scabbard of Excalibur slipped from his belt just as he plunged his lance into the betraying heart of his son. With the last of his strength, Mordred struck his father a fatal blow to the skull. Arthur asked Sir Bedivere to throw Excalibur into the lake from whence it came. The sword and Arthur were carried back to the lake, and Morgan le Fay, Nimue, and their fellow magical sister queens appeared in a barge to carry the dying king into the mists of Avalon, possibly to bury him, possibly to heal his wounds. The legend promises that in Britain's hour of greatest need, Arthur, the once and future king, will return to save his people. At the end of the story, Lancelot rode to see Guinevere at her convent. She was consumed by guilt and regret and refused to come away with him. She lived the rest of her life as a nun and when she died, Lancelot buried her next to Arthur's symbolic grave. Arthurian Legends in History From the mouths of medieval loot-strumming troubadours to modern blockbuster movies, King Arthur and the rest of the cast of mythical characters have long enchanted audiences. And they have evolved along with the times. Guinevere and Morgan le Fay in particular have been cast as virtuous holy women, evil temptresses, and tragic lovers, depending on the era and the role women played in it. Although paintings and modern directors often place Arthurian legends in the High Middle Ages, they were actually much earlier, in the late 400s and early 500s. The characters in the legends may have been based on real historic people, but there are no records of a real King Arthur or a round table, though many have speculated on their existence. The site of Camelot is generally placed in southwestern England. Tintagel Castle in Cornwall has claimed to be the birthplace of Arthur, but the ruins that exist there are not old enough, dating back to the 13th century. The mystical island of Avalon is believed to have been Gastonbury Tor, a hill surrounded by lowlands which would have been flooded in the 6th century. For 500 years, tales and songs of King Arthur were shared by word of mouth around fires great and small. 
shortly after William the Conqueror took over England in 1066. Author Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote The History of the Kings of Britain to glorify the new regime. This tome included some of the first recorded accounts of Camelot and became a medieval bestseller. Geoffrey focused primarily on battles and only mentioned Queen Guinevere briefly as the hero's obligatory wife. The queen's character began to take shape a century later in the work of French author Chrétien de Troyes. He was writing under the patronage of Marie, Countess of Champagne, the daughter of Eleanor of Aquitaine and King Louis VII of France. Marie was a powerful and dynamic woman, just like her mother. She spent a great deal of time at the court of Aquitaine, also known as the court of love. Eleanor of Aquitaine cultivated an atmosphere of chivalry, where troubadours were always welcome to recount tales of bravery and romance. In these stories, Morgan Le Fay is a benevolent and aloof character who frequently shows up to heal Arthur and his knights when they're in trouble. Chrétien du Trois was the first to introduce Sir Lancelot and the love triangle between he, Guinevere, and Arthur. Next, the stories were adapted by another unknown French author in the Vulgate Cycle. These epic poems married the Arthurian legends with Christian concepts of purity, faithfulness, and devotion to God and duty. The quest for the Holy Grail became a central part of the story right at the time when Western European crusaders were finally giving up their failed attempts to conquer the Holy Lands. These stories of a holy relic and God's blessing on Western Europe helped the faithful refocus their energies and deal with their defeat. In the Vulgate Cycle, Guinevere's adultery is justified by Arthur's liaison with a beautiful Saxon princess named Camille. He is further unfaithful with Guinevere's evil half-sister, born to her father and his mistress, who looks identical to the queen, was born on the same day, and is also named Guinevere. Arthur disgraces himself by taking this other Guinevere as a second wife, thus making the queen a more sympathetic character. One 14th century poem, The Adventures of Arthur, introduces Guinevere's mother, who appears as a hideous ghost and reveals that she has been condemned to suffer for the sins of adultery and pride. She pleads with her daughter to avoid these crimes and prophesizes that the round table will be destroyed. Guinevere arranges masses to be said and church bells to be rung to free her poor mother's soul from purgatory. Queen Eleanor of Castile, the wife of famous warrior King Edward I of England, was a big fan of the Arthurian legends. She and her husband had many parallels with the legendary royal couple. And Eleanor, who had a great head for public relations, emphasized these to their people. Two 6th century graves had been discovered on the grounds of Gastonbury Abbey, which were believed to be those of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere. King Edward I and Queen Eleanor orchestrated a magnificent service and personally carried the supposed bones of the legendary royals to be reburied at the foot of the altar. In the mid-1400s, Sir Thomas Mallory wrote Le Mort du Arthur, The Death of Arthur. The 21 book, 507 chapter tome is the most referenced version of the legends in English to this day. Mallory portrayed the female characters with clear misogyny. This was typical for the times, but also particular to the author's personal views on women. Mallory was accused of rape twice in his lifetime. He cast Guinevere as a sinful, fallen woman who entrapped Lancelot with magic, while Arthur is the blameless, betrayed husband. Morgan Le Fay became a psychopathic femme fatale who tortured virtuous Arthur for no reason. 
In 1485, the year that Le Morte d'Arthur was posthumously published, Henry VII defeated Richard III on the battlefield and took the throne of England. His claim of royal lineage was somewhat dubious, so to strengthen his new Tudor dynasty, he ordered genealogists to trace his lineage back to King Arthur. Amazingly, they found connections between the new king and his fictitious ancestor. King Henry's wife, Elizabeth of York, traveled to present-day Winchester, which was at the time believed to have been the site of Camelot, and there she gave birth to their first son, who was named Arthur. But there was never a King Arthur II of England, as the prince died of the sweating sickness at the age of 15. His father was instead succeeded by his second son, King Henry VIII. During his reign, a round table, supposedly that of King Arthur, was discovered and is still on display at Winchester Castle. The paintings, including the Tudor Rose, are from Henry's era, and alas, the wood of the table has been dated back to the 13th century and was probably built for the wedding feast of Queen Eleanor of Castile's daughter. During the Renaissance and Enlightenment, people were looking to science, rationality, and the future rather than chivalry, mysticism, and the past. Arthurian legends fell out of fashion for several hundred years, but in the mid-1800s, the Victorians had a renewed interest in traditional values and chivalric ideals. Arthur and his companions re-emerged in many works of poetry and prose, most famously in Alfred Tennyson's Isles of the King, and later in Mark Twain's Satire, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. The Fair Maidens, Guinevere, Morgan Le Fay, and Nimue were favorite subjects of the Pre-Raphaelite painters, who brought these characters to life in vivid, romantic detail. In the 20th century, renewed interest in mysticism and the pagan religion have highlighted the female inhabitants of Avalon. Arthurian legends continue to be popular subject matter for stage and screen. The female characters have often remained the objects of love and purveyors of chaos, but have begun to claim their own agency and motivations in more recent retellings. Guinevere has been portrayed by Julie Andrews in the 1960 Broadway musical Camelot by Lena Headley in the 1998 miniseries Merlin, by Kira Knightley in the 2004 film King Arthur, and by Kate Dickey in 2021's The Green Knight. Morgan Le Fay was reshaped as Madame Mim, Merlin's nemesis in Disney's 1963 animated film The Sword in the Stone. She was evil when played by Helen Murin in the 1981 film Excalibur, and good when played by Juliana Margulies in the 2001 miniseries The Mists of Avalon. The Lady of the Lake was brilliantly satirized in the 1975 film Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which points out that strange women lying in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government. Nimue is portrayed by Isabella Rossellini in the 1998 miniseries Merlin, and Catherine Langford takes her center stage in the 2020 Netflix series Cursed. Queen Guinevere and the other mystical, romantic, and endlessly fascinating women of Arthurian legend will doubtlessly be portrayed in a variety of new ways for centuries to come. Right now, fans of my channel can go to nordvpn.com slash lindsayholiday to get a two-year plan plus four additional months with a huge discount. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.